this is Kyle, also known as Alien Tude, and today I have this Valiant Armory Irish Ring Leaf Blade Longsword for review. And that is a mouthful of a name. Now some background on this sword. I bought it direct from Valiant Armory at CombatCon 2023, and I had, didn't expect to buy it. I didn't expect to buy anything from Valiant Armory. But then I got there, I saw all their beautiful swords, I thought I was going to buy the Vision Milan, and I was very close to doing so. And then I pulled this one out of the scabbard, and I was struck by the blade, and how it felt a little bit lighter than I expected. And I was really struck by the blade, and I ended up buying this sword. It sells new for $1,595 with the included scabbard. Now, Valiant Armory doesn't have them in stock. But you can order direct from them or through Cult of Athena if you want. And I believe their turnaround time is around four to eight months. Age of Chivalry does have several different versions of this sword in stock with a couple different color combinations. Links to all those in the description. Now, this sword is not really based on history. It has takes historical principles, but... There's no swords like this from history that I'm aware of. Leaf blades were absolutely a thing. You saw them on several different models of Gladius. You saw them on Celtic swords. They tended to be more common on bronze swords than iron or steel, but they definitely existed, although I am not aware of any that were this long. Similarly, Irish ring pommels existed. They were more late medieval and the name, as the name implies, they were popular on Irish swords. For a bit more detail on them, check out my review of the Albion Kern where I talked about that styling and that type of pommel a little bit more. So there's historical concepts here, but this entire sword is a bit more of a fantasy piece than something that is a direct copy or replica from history. So one of the big selling points of Valiant Armory is that they come by default with a scabbard. And generally speaking, these are quite high quality scabbards. Maybe not quite as high quality as you can get if you go full on custom, but they are very good quality, properly made wood core scabbards with nice leather and generally speaking, pretty simple designs, but very nice designs. If we look here, you can see that this is a mahogany color, just like the grip, and the design on it actually follows the contours of the blade. This little section here mirrors the uh, fuller on the blade, and then there's like a line carved in that mirrors the outline of the blade. Just a nice detail that makes the scabbard fit the sword a bit more. Now, if we're looking at the fit, there's quite a bit of rattle here, and that is not the least bit surprising because with the blade shape, you can't really get a super snug scabbard in general because, you know, it's the widest part of the blade is down here, not up here. So this whole part where it, the blade is thinner, it needs to still accommodate the wider part of the blade. So you're not going to get quite as snug of a fit as a more traditional blade shape. Now, the other thing to be said is that Valiant Armory intentionally makes their scabbards a little bit looser than some people like, because if the sword or if the scabbard changes, they don't want it to seize up and grab onto the sword and suddenly you can't get the sword out. So they do intentionally make it just a touch looser than what some would prefer. And this one is very loose. I can't hold it upside down without it falling right out. That is, again, a little looser than I would like, but it's not really a criticism because there is real intention behind it. Now, this also came with a suspension system, and you can see how much I've used it by the fact that I never even took it out of the bag. So if I take it out of the bag here, we've got a black belt, and a couple straps that are for securing the suspension. There's some designs carved into here. It looks like some floral designs and a pretty simple buckle on here. Uh, one of 
the few criticisms I have of Valiant Armory scabbards is I always find their belts to feel a little cheaper leather quality than their uh, actual scabbards. And the buckles generally don't have quite as nice of a look to them. They have a bit more of a inexpensive look to them that I think is something that could be improved. Looking at the hilt components, let's start with the Irish ring pommel. This is a pretty big and thick example of an Irish ring pommel, which kind of makes sense considering how large the sword is overall. That helps to balance it out. The finish on here is a pretty smooth and even satin. There are still some grind lines visible, although I do notice less grind lines than you'll see typically on, say, an Albion. Now, there is also a little bit of patina in a few spots, both on the inside and then also on the visible tang. This pommel is something of a bear to keep pristine because there's so many nooks and crannies. You know, I've been fastidious about keeping everything oiled, and I still apparently have missed a few spots because of those little bits of patina. However, it's very light and should clean up very simply and easily. Now, the corners of the pommel have been chamfered over, but they are still pretty crisp, and with the wrong type of cut, they can bite the hand a little bit. I'll talk about that more during handling. The peen block on here is beautifully done. It is on here perfectly straight and just expertly placed on here. Again, better than what I've seen from Albion's. And the peen is big and very well finished, nicely circular, no air and hammer marks visible anywhere, just overall a very cleanly peened sword. Moving on to the grip here, it is also quite big, not just in length, but also in girth. It's just overall a pretty hefty sized grip. And now I typically am not a huge fan of overly girthy grips, but this does not strike me as overly girthy. It's big, but it fits in my hands very, very well. It is shaped beautifully. The craftsmanship on the shaping of the grip here is outstanding. There's a lot of dimension to it where it swells out here and then tapers in here. Just like there, there's no flat edges anywhere. It's all curved over and just masterfully crafted. This is a beautiful example of a grip and the leather work is absolutely top-notch as well. Absolutely beautiful. Valiant Armory does at least as well as Albion in their leather work on their grips. And this is no exception. The, the risers are super crisp. The cord texture is beautiful. The transitions, perfect. This is an absolutely gorgeous grip and extremely effective too. And you know, since the grip is the primary interface for how the user is going to interact with the sword, it's one of the things that's most important to get right and this grip is done right. And just a couple other notes, this is the mahogany color, I believe, and the seam here is very straight, not noticeable by touch. You can definitely see it because the die is a little bit different there, but it's not exactly a big deal. Now the cross guard is also big, and interestingly, this cross guard is very, very similar to the one that Valiant Armor uses on their model Warden of the North, which is inspired by ice from Game of Thrones. Although if you look at that one, the part that extends into the grip is definitely longer on the Warden of the North as opposed to this one. This is finished in a satin that's pretty similar to the pommel, although you can tell here with more surface area, it's a very matte satin. You can definitely still make out some grime lines, but it has a very matte look to it that I really appreciate. If we look closer, there are a few flaws in the finish here and there, but they're very, very minor. I really like the overall design of this cross guard. While it is very large right here, that it helps to accommodate a, probably a larger tang, a pretty wide blade, and overall, it also helps with the balance, which I'll get into later. I like how it flares out at the tip, quill and tips in this aesthetically pleasing design. 
Overall, it just looks really nice. If we look at the slot in the cross guard where the blade enters it, you can see it's very well shaped on, from the surfaces of the blade to the slot. That's very well done. Although the edges here at the edge of the blade, there's a little bit of extra space. I am guessing that is from the fact that this cross guard is pretty much used also for another model. I'm betting that other model is a little bit wider than this one. But you know, slight gaps where the sword meets the cross guard is not a problem. It's some people really swear by it and really want it to be tight. I happen to like how it looks tight, but it doesn't affect the functionality at all, presuming the sword's made correctly, which this one is, and it doesn't affect the historicalness of the sword because historical swords range the gamut from how with how big their the slots in the cross guard were with, I would say, the majority of them being a lot larger than what we see on high-end production swords today. And now it's time to talk about the business end, the blade. As always, here's my measurements. So this blade is pretty long at just about 36 inches, and it has a complicated geometry. It starts at 2 inches wide, wasting into around 1.4 inches, and then swelling back out to around 1.6 inches in that iconic leaf shape. And then it tapers to a very acute point. The blade starts at 6 millimeters thick and very quickly tapers a full millimeter in the first 6 inches. And then it evens that distal taper out throughout the rest of the blade, ending around 3 millimeters thick. Now right up front, one thing I want to say is I find this blade profile and just the blade overall just incredibly attractive. There is something very alluring about the way this sword looks and especially the blade. Part of that is the finish. It's a very even satin finish that has only very minor grind lines visible here and there. There are some scratches and scuffs after cutting, but I don't really mind them. But overall, the blade is just one of the most stunning blades in my collection. And my collection has some very, very nice swords, so that should tell you something. The fullers on here are beautifully done. Very crisp, perfectly straight, and they end at pretty much the exact same spot on both sides. The tip is very well formed, although if you look close at it, you can see a trace of sharpening where the, the geometry of the blade there with how narrow it is, it makes sharpening without leaving any kind of micro bevel or secondary bevel really difficult. Unfortunately, you can also see that it looks like it might have overheated a little bit during the sharpening as there's a little bit of blackness there. I don't think it needs to be sharpened there. I think the tip would be better left a little bit thicker and more durable to reinforce the tip and then you don't have to worry about overheating it when you're sharpening it. So looking at the overall profile, again, this sword is just gorgeous. The wasting here, the swelling out in that leaf shape, it's all so smooth and evenly done and just masterfully crafted. It is beautiful, both in overall looks, but also when you get into the details. Looking down the surfaces of the blade, no rippling, whatsoever. Perfectly smooth. That takes a lot of effort and it really is a testament to Valiant Armory's skill. If we look at the beveling here, it's one smooth bevel all the way to the edge. I don't see any micro bevel or secondary bevel except like I mentioned a bit earlier in the tip where it is noticeable. After some careful review of footage, I do notice a very small micro bevel in some places. Let's do some quick paper cutting to see what the edges are like on the sword. As always, this is not about testing the sword's sharpness so much as it is providing context to the cutting ability. If a sword is able to cleanly cut paper and not cut targets, that says there's something kind of odd going on. If the sword is able to cleanly cut targets but not paper, well, that might be that the blade has really good geometry for cutting. So this is all about providing context to the cutting footage you're going to see. So it cut there very cleanly, very easily. And then once it got down here, it kind of stopped, which is 
no big deal because I'm not cutting down here anyways. Let's test the other edge now. And that was also a very clean and easy cut. So this sword is very clearly paper cutting sharp. I will say there is one edge that is probably a little less sharp than the other, but I will talk about that more in the cutting section. Let's take a look at some cutting footage. Now I cut both water bottles and tatami with this sword. As you just saw, it has two well-sharpened edges, so it should come as no real surprise that it cuts water bottles quite well. You can target at the swell where it's, you know, the sweet spot of the sword and it cuts well, but you can also target a little further out or a little further back. And it handles water bottles with, like that very, very well. It handles light targets well. It handles heavier targets quite well. So you can see there, I definitely scooped. I started twisting the sword instead of going all the way straight through. So overall, it handles water bottles as a very capable backyard cutter. Now I did do the armored milk jug where I put a t-shirt over a milk jug and it did manage to cut all the way through the milk jug. Didn't get through the cloth on the opposite side and the cut in the cloth was not particularly large, but it did handle and did cut all the way through the milk jug, which is more than a lot of swords that I could say. Now, when I did that cut, my technique was a little bit off. I My edge alignment seemed fine, but I didn't accelerate the tip quite as well as I wanted to. That could play into it as, some as well. As for tatami, now, first off, I want to apologize. My tatami stand is off center from the camera. I had done more than one tatami cut on this day and the stand got moved. I didn't realize it. So I, I apologize for the slightly funky angle. I focused on overhouse here because I am trying to improve my technique and that is the most basic technique. So I wanna focus on getting that down before moving into more complicated techniques. And as you can see, it did cut tatami quite well. So what Philip Martin told me at Valley of the Sun is when you have the uh, strings here that are kind of being pulled out and not cut cleanly, it usually means there's a burr on the sword. So on the first cut, when I used the leaf blade, that's what it did. After I switched to the other edge, it started giving much cleaner cuts. So it looks like one edge has a burr that could use to be cleaned up. So keeping in mind there might be one small burr on one edge, this sword still handles tatami and the targets I like to cut very well. It is a effective backyard cutter. All right, so handling and comparisons. First up, this is a big sword. It is long in the blade, around 36 inches, and long in the hilt, and overall just quite a large blade. It is balanced very nicely at around three inches. I haven't actually taken measurements yet, so I, I don't know the exact amount, but that looked like about three inches. And if we look at the vibration nodes, it vibrates, or it doesn't, the percussion node in the blade is right where it is the widest part of the, the swell here. That's a perfect place. And then in the hilt, it's right where you want it to be, right around the up near where my hand is gripping it. So all in all, that's a very good and well-designed percussion nodes. What I will say though, is because the hilt is so long, if we look here, you can see the pommel still vibrates quite a bit. And that's because with the percussion node being up here, there's enough length between that and the pommel that the pommel does end up vibrating. And I have gotten on some less successful cuts, I have gotten a little bit of uh, feedback from the pommel into my hand that didn't feel that great. Better cuts would alleviate that. So the sword is very lively. That point of balance being around three inches means I can move it around very easily. I can put it exactly where I want it to be within the limits of my abilities. And I really do think it handles well. And it can even be handled in one hand 
even at three and a half pounds with that long of a grip, I can definitely move this around one handed. It's not particularly pleasant and easy, but it is possible. All that being said, this handles well. The tip, there's blade presence out there and I don't feel a ton of tip weight. All that being said, I don't really like the handling of the sword. It handles well. It is well designed. It is executed very well. But the handling is not for me. And I think a large part of that is just how long everything is on the blade. This very long hilt, 36 inch blade, it all just makes it a little bit more cumbersome than I want it to be. I think I prefer a slightly shorter blade, maybe around 33 to 34 inches, and a slightly shorter hilt, which would bring the weight down a little bit. Not, not that this is overweight, but it would bring the weight down a little bit and just make it a little bit faster in my hands. Again, my hands. This is my opinion. I'm not saying this is poor, handles poorly. It doesn't. It handles very well. It just is not quite how I want the sword to handle. And I want to diagnose this a little bit and why this, I, I don't quite connect with the handling of this sword. So you've got this swell out here. That means that there's more weight out this way than there would typically be on a long sword where it would, you know, it would typically have much more traditional profile taper. You've got a pommel that while this is a pretty thick uh, ring pommel, it's still a ring pommel. There's a huge amount of uh, empty space here that is not adding weight to the to help counterbalance the sword. You know, there's this idea that pommels, that's what they're exactly for, is counterbalancing it. There's a lot more to it than that. But the fact that this is such a lightweight pommel means that you end up having to add weight to the hilt in other ways. It seems like to me what Valiant Armory did here, they put a pretty hefty cross guard on it. You know, this whole portion right here is quite big and a, a little bit larger than you would typically see. And it's also just got a pretty beefy grip. Not in a bad way. I can move this around very easily. I can control it very easily. This is a very effective grip. But it looks to me like the tang is probably a bit hefty here as well. And they probably did this to bring more weight into the hilt to help counter the fact that there's probably a bit more weight out here than you would typically see. All that is to say that the weight of the sword, the way it actually handles, the weight is a little bit more up here than back here. And it's just a little different, a little odd to me. I don't find it quite intuitive. That's not to say, again, it's not to say it handles poorly. It doesn't, it handles very well. It just is not my style of handling. It's possible that the more experience I get, I would end up liking it more. But for me, as what I've seen of it so far, it's just not quite right for me. So for a comparison to the Valiant Armory, I have here the Albion Principe. And I chose this one as a comparison because it has a nice long grip too, although you can see there the Valiant Armory has a considerably longer overall hilt. And it's heavier, but it handles more like I'm used to in a longsword. It doesn't have the same uniqueness to the overall design as this Valiant Armory. So this is more familiar to me. Let me put down the Valiant Armory. So yeah, this is a full half pound heavier than the VA, but to me, it's immediately more familiar with the way it moves around because it's much more standard for a longsword. It doesn't have to overcome the different geometries that the Valiant Armory does. So this, because I have more experience with quote unquote normal longswords, this feels natural. This feels like exactly what I expect it to feel. Yes, it's a hefty blade. This is not a light blade. It's almost four pounds, but it doesn't feel different. It just feels like a hefty blade. Whereas the Valiant Armory at three and a half pounds about feels just a lot different. And I have to stress again, I am not saying it feels bad. It doesn't feel bad. Neither does the Principe, of course, but it doesn't feel bad, it just feels different. So yeah, I picked this up. It definitely feels lighter than the Principe. There's no doubt. 
and it, but it does feel like it has more blade presence, more weight out here, and then more weight right here. Whereas the Principe feels like it's a little more distributed throughout the entire blade. Now, some people are going to love the way this feels. I have no doubt about that. Because it's balanced very well and handles well, it just doesn't handle well for my personal tastes. So one other thing I want to talk, touch on is how the pommel feels when cutting. There's a lot of different ways to grip this sword because the grip is so long. If I just keep my hands slightly separated, there is plenty of room to move, to move the sword around and not interact with the pommel at all. However, it doesn't feel quite right. I like moving my hands apart more with this sword. And if I grip it right there, kind of half gripping the pommel and half gripping the grip, this I found kind of problematic because these edges are pretty crisp and it was biting my hand just a little bit. Oddly though, if I move my hand down a little bit more so where I'm mostly gripping the pommel and not the grip at all, kind of resting against my palm, I had no problems at all like this. It never really caused me any discomfort, except like I said earlier, when I had some bad cuts and some of the reverber reverberations through the sword bit the hand a little bit, not terribly, but there was some there. So let's talk about a few potential improvements that this that could be made to this sword. And I am not going to talk about the handling of this sword because although I spent a good amount of time talking about how I don't think it's quite right for me, it doesn't mean it's bad handling, it just means it's not right for me. So there's a few other things I have identified. The first being the tip. While it's very well formed, it does look like they overheated the tip a tiny bit when sharpening it. And now this could really use to be filed down just a touch to remove that part that is slightly uh, blackened. I don't think the tip needs to be sharpened, so I would prefer to see it more like a reinforced tip. And after that, we're getting into the nitty gritty details. The first of which would be the cross guard slot here. This could be brought in just a little bit to meet the width of the blade better. Very, very minor. And the other having to do with the scabbard, I think these buckles could be have, look better. They have a very inexpensive look to them that just doesn't feel good on such an expensive sword. And similarly, the belt has a, the leather feels just a little lower quality and very stiff and just not up to the standard of the rest of their leather work. So bottom line, this sword retails for just under $1,600. What do you get for that price? You get an absolutely stunning sword that is one of the prettiest swords I've ever owned. You get a sword that, while not historical in design, it, is, it still incorporates historical principles to make it an effective sword. You get a sword that is a very effective backyard cutter and that has a fantasy vibe to it. And you get a sword that has a lot of presence to it while still handling well. Is it worth the price? Yes, unequivocally. I absolutely think this sword is worth the price. Aside from the sheer beauty of it, there are so few leaf bladed long swords or longer leaf blade swords on the market that it's a very unique entry in the market. You know, I know Angus Trim will occasionally do leaf blade swords. I believe West Beam will do leaf blade swords. But at that point, you're not talking about production swords, really. With Angus Trim, he kind of just makes whatever he wants. With West Beam, or you could probably go to somebody like Longship Armory for a leaf blade. But at that point, you're talking about customs. The price goes up with customs, and the wait time goes up and you have to make sure that they're interested in your project. There's a lot more to a custom than just ordering something like this that is a production model and being able to get it within four to eight months if you can't find one in stock. All that's to say that uh, if you want a leaf blade, Valiant Armory is pretty much the go-to stop for them. Now, it, the sword handles very well. There's no doubt about that. It just doesn't handle quite right for me. So for me, is it worth that price? That's a bit harder of a decision to make. I 
I absolutely think this sword is worth the price if this is what you're looking for. I think for me, the handling kind of detracts from it a little bit. And I have to say again, this is not bad handling. It's just not right handling for me. You know, different strokes for different folks. Everybody has a different taste in what they want their swords to do. And this one is not quite right for me. That said, I love the look of this sword so much that it might manage to stay, to, to be worth it to me for the price purely based on how gorgeous I find this sword it to be. You know, I might end up selling this sword. I'm not sure. But it's a really tough choice because I just love the look of it so very much. And I want to wrap up this bottom line section by talking about Valiant Armory in general, not so much about this specific sword. I want to say that Valiant Armory is well worth your attention. You know, in the high-end production market, you have the name Albion. It's the name everybody knows. It's kind of the go-to name. And Albion deserves that reputation. You also have things like, names like Arms and Armor and Angus Trim, and they have very good stuff. But Albion stands atop the heap of the high-end production European sword market. And they deserve that. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. They deserve that. Valiant Armory deserves to be in that conversation just as much. Their swords may be a little bit less historically designed, not that they're off, but they have a little bit more creative license taken with their designs, whereas Albion tries to stick mostly to either direct replicas or swords that are very appropriate for the time period and could be taken back and fit in as a very typical sword of a time period. Valiant Armory, like I said, gets a little more creative with their designs, but their swords are outstanding. Their leather work is outstanding. Everything that they do, their swords are outstanding, and they don't have the name recognition that Albion does, especially in the more casual market, and they deserve to. So I'm not saying pr prefer Valiant Armory over Albion. What I'm saying is that if you're looking for that special high-end production sword, don't just look at Albion. Expand your range, look at Valiant Armory, because they deserve to get your attention and perhaps your order. And with that, I'm calling this review done. I want to say thank you for sticking through the whole review if you managed to do so. And if you haven't, please hit the like button, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. That helps YouTube know that you would like the channel, you wanna see more content like it, and to help the channel continue to grow. Until next time, Alien Toot out.